In this section, we're going to look at PSM and with an introduction to what is PSM, how it has evolved, and how it all fits together with the various frameworks out there. When we look at what is PSM, there are a few things we've got to go through. Some terminology, uh, global trends, the development, the various models, drivers, etc. You can see here the list of things that we're going to go through in this uh, presentation. When we look at terminology, let's look at setting the baseline. Risk is a combination of what can go wrong, how bad could it be, and how often might it happen. When we look at risk-based, it depicts one or more risk attributes of a process, activity, or facility. Considering any one of the three risk questions above can be viewed as a risk based activity. For simplicity, rather than use a term such as hazard based, consequence based, or frequency based, the single term risk based is used to mean any one or a combination of these terms. Global trends, oil and gas specific, but generally you can say it's the same for other sectors. We know that in terms of occupational safety performance for various oil and gas companies, BP for example, which was my previous employer, we can see that over the years from 1992 to 2010, there has been a reduction in the reportable incidents per productivity or man hours worked. Now global trends in terms of major incidents, again looking at it from 1974 to 2010, some of these are very, very familiar. They had some very high profile exposure, especially in the news. For example, Texas Refinery and uh, Flixborough was a one that was very well covered. So you can see that from a global trends, we've got incidents that have happened for many, many years. Now, not to dwell too long on this particular slide, but as you can see in terms of global trends, the damage in terms of dollars per thousand barrels refinery, and I said this was an oil and gas uh, input, you can see it has increased over the years from 1964 to 2000. The message there is it's getting costly. So process safety versus occupational safety. What exactly is, is it? Why, why is process safety different from occupational safety? Well, process safety is not normal. Most people, not all, lack specific experience and please don't toast me for this that's just a general opinion more robust analyses are required to identify the hazards hazards being something that can cause harm and unacceptable consequences need more reliable controls but the most important message here is that process safety related incidents have far-reaching devastating impacts in the previous slide you saw some of the impacts relative to loss of life, Texas refinery, Flixbrick, etc. They can be significantly damaging to an organization. Let's look at the evolution of process safety strategies. You can see the slides here go in terms of standard based strategy, compliance, continuous improvement and risk based strategy, which is what we're looking at specifically. Now in the standards based strategy, normally happens and what should I do? You look at ANSI, API, ASME, NFPA, etc. Apologies for the acronyms, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. In compliance-based strategy, what do I have to do? Well, you look at OSHA for process safety management, EPA, and Cerveso 3, etc. This are, these are very regulatory driven. Continuous improvement-based strategy are how can I improve based upon my experience? Again, many of you will be familiar with the management systems associated with health, safety and environment, specifically OSHA 18001, ISO 14001, etc. And risk-based strategy. How can I improve risk management? Well, risk-based, lagging, leading indicators to improve. Now, slide on PSM development. In 1992, the final OSHA PSM standard was issued. In 89, CCPS published their original PSM elements, followed by, in 2007, CCPS publishing the guidelines for risk-based process safety. And there, there are two specific documents, the 2007 CCPS published guidance 
for effective pre-startup safety reviews and CCPS published guidelines for risk-based process safety. Let's not worry too much about the documents here. We'll be covering all of these and the various elements bit by bit and also more importantly looking at the various components in it, metrics etc. We must also mention that in 2010 the Energy Institute published the framework for high level process safety management. Let's now look at PSM models. We mentioned OSHA and we mentioned CCPS. OSHA has 14 elements stroke standards and the CCPS risk-based process safety has 20 elements. Fundamentally they follow this principle of hazard identification analyzing risks, measuring success, mitigation and management programs on hazards and understanding process safety hazards. Now let's look at PSM drivers. The important issues to address in a PSM framework are the purpose and scope is it clearly defined? Are personnel roles and the responsibilities established? What about tasks and procedures? Are they mapped out? And is the necessary input information available? Are we aware of the anticipated results and work products? Do we know what we're getting into here? And do personnel have appropriate qualifications and training to follow through on the PSM aspirations and framework? Now, does the organization also have the necessary resources and tools? Has there been alignment on metrics for continuous improvement? And what about management review? Is there a process and a schedule defined? And finally, let's not forget auditing. Is the auditing plan in place and are resources available? These are just examples. I'm sure there are more, but there are main examples for the important issues to address in a PSM framework. What about the OSHA PSM model? Here's, a, here's an overview on that. Mentioned earlier, there are 14 key elements or standards. Not to dwell too long on this, but I'm listing here the various bits of the OSHA PSM framework. There are 14. And you can see it goes from the various points from employee participation through to training, contractors, PSSR is pre-startup safety review, management of change and emergency response plans. CCPS risk-based process safety. There are four pieces essentially. Commit to process safety culture which really has five elements. Understanding hazards and risks, two key elements. Managing risks and it goes on to finally learn from experience. There are 20 elements, as mentioned, that all play a pivotal role in the risk-based process safety framework. The next, the next slide is a little bit busy, and I apologize in advance for that. But this is just to give you a quick overview on a comparison, if you like, between the various um, models. Here is the risk-based process safety. This is the original CCPS uh, PSM element and the OSHA uh, framework. You can see they all slot in nicely in terms of bits to do within those four key areas that I mentioned earlier. From experience, PSM benefits, what does it do in terms of risk reduction? Years 1 to 5, typically I've seen a reduction of 40%. Years 6 to 10, you can go up to 80%. This results in cost of incidents reduced and bad publicity being eliminated. So risk-based process safety. Some of the challenges are when you're trying to implement it in your organization, developing an adequately detailed and accurate understanding of risk, getting over the initial difficulty and in getting the right metrics in place. As I mentioned, this can get very messy, it can be very confusing, and it can also be a noose around the organization's neck. Acquiring the discipline required to maintain these performance metrics. It's all about continuity and continuous improvement. As I said, progress can only be made if progress is measured. And developing trust and integrity. Overcoming resistance to change. This goes to culture, which is a very, very key part. Having the right culture in place and the workforce involvement goes a long way in terms of getting your PSM successfully implemented and really delivering. Earlier we talked about the four key parts of the CCPS framework 
commit to process safety, understanding hazards and evaluating risks, managing the risks and learning from experience. Then explained that there are various elements in these key pieces of the pillar. There are five elements in this particular pillar, commit to process safety, going to nine in the managing of risks. One would say this is the most demanding part, but also I would say everything is demanding, it's all relative within your organisation. And learning from experience is important, it forms a part of the continuous improvement loop. And finally, the house picture. Many of you will be familiar with this house picture in terms of how the pillars are depicted forming this house diagram. You can see that at the bottom line are the four pillars from commit to process safety through to learn from experience and how these vertical pillars are representing the elements. So the bottom line is the foundation and the pillars are there putting the roof on place which is part of your process safety management system. What is culture? Culture is a combination of values and behaviours that drives how safety is managed. Other succinct definitions include how we do things around here, what we expect here, or how we behave when no one is watching. Why is process safety culture important for safety? If you watch the introduction to PSM, you will have seen this particular slide which shows a number of incidents from 1974 to 2010. We know historically from catastrophic events that culture plays a key role. Some lessons have shown absent features included a lack of high standards on requirements for process safety performance. There's a lack of a sense of vulnerability. In other words, the Superman concept. There's inadequate, open and effective communication. And there's a poor response time on process safety issues and concerns. We can sound cultural practices in CCPS's guidelines for risk-based process safety, the 2007 edition. There is a table, table 3.1, which provides a list of weak culture and sound culture uh, specific items. You can see the theme here that for a sound culture, the organization has good core values, there's a focus on potential failures, and there's an emphasis on learning from the past, and employees are involved. Now, is there a magic ingredient? It requires collective effort, from the boardroom to the shop floor. Successful cultural change requires communication and reinforcement of new attitudes and behaviors. Demonstrating successful results, this drives positivity and leadership recognition, appreciation and support. That feeling of being wanted. Expectations, well, it must occur everywhere, from the boardroom to the production floor. Leadership has the primary responsibility. It's the catalyst. Everyone in the organization has a role. No passengers and no observers. It requires dedicated resources for as long as the organization exists and it's not quickly achieved. It requires patience and perseverance. But remember, step change is the hardest part, not the intensity of effort. But once it's established, it should become the norm and be part of the DNA. Focusing on specifics now in terms of application, maintaining a dependable practice, in other words, it has to be reliable and sustainable. What do we need to do? Well, we need to establish and enforce high standards of performance. Document the process safety culture emphasis and approach. We need to establish process safety as a core value and provide strong leadership. But how do we develop a sound culture? We need to maintain that sense of vulnerability. Empower individuals to successfully fulfill their safety responsibilities. Make sure we have open and effective communication. Have timely responses on issues related to safety. And have a questioning and learning environment. This fosters mutual trust. And refer or defer to expertise. 
Following up on decisions and actions and use of compliance results is also important, forms a part of the monitoring process. So we need to provide continuous monitoring of performance. The important thing about metrics is, I'm sure most of you are familiar, there is quantitative and qualitative metrics. Qualitative are subjective, inductive, words-based, etc. Whereas quantitative, it is based upon numbers and it's subjective and based upon deduction, deductive techniques. Panning back to the metrics for dependable, if we look at what we could have as metrics, here are some examples of what could be key performance indicators. Leadership site visit frequency, percentage of trained managers, etc. Percentage of meetings that address process safety, percentage receiving reward and recognition, how about performance metrics related to process safety events or process safety incident rates? Now, for the definitions for these items, please download the abbreviations and definitions document attached to this uh, package. And another one is the relative frequency of favoured subjects. How many of you have been in meetings where sometimes the same conversation pops up over and over again and Hence, it is a favoured subject. That's the dependable side. Now, we also talked about developing factors. We could look at the number of open recommendations. How about the number of near misses and incidents reported each month? What is the response time for completing incident investigations? How about near misses and incidents caused by unsafe acts or shortcuts? The frequency with which relevant process safety statistics are shared. What is the average response time? to the resolution of a process safety suggestion. And what are the number of process safety suggestions reported each month? But how many people or percentage of employees participate in the process safety suggestion program every month? What is the manager attendance at these review meetings? In terms of metrics for monitoring, let's consider the frequency with which relevant process safety metrics are prepared and shared with leadership or the results of periodic employee attitudes or perception surveys. Now, there's an important theme here. We talked about quantitative and qualitative metrics. So when you looked at the three items we discussed earlier, dependable, developing and monitoring, it's important to go back and do a revisit. And let's look at it from a quantitative and qualitative perspective, where the quantitative is in the red circle and qualitative will be in the blue circle. You'll note that all of the ones listed were quantitative. How about from a, for the developing aspects? Again, all of the metrics were quantitative. And there's no doubt from a monitoring perspective, they were also quantitative. So for metrics, in conclusion, and you'll probably have heard me say this many times before, progress can only be made if progress is measured. Quantitative and qualitative, we know now that we have to have those in terms of monitoring metric. What do we mean by standards? Many of you will be familiar with standards. You're familiar with codes, regulations, laws, internal practices. Does this look familiar? I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. They're the ASME standards, and I'm sure you're familiar with other standards like APIs uh, and OSHA regulations, etc. Within this element and associated activities, the intention is to support the identification of the standards, to develop the standards relative to your organization, to evaluate whether you're in compliance, whether it's a necessary requirement, and to disseminate the information to the appropriate people. After all, if they don't know what standards they have to adhere to, it's pretty difficult to be compliant. And finally, standards should be accessible. It shouldn't be stuck in a cupboard somewhere waiting to be found. You should be aware and your organization should be aware of which ones are particularly applicable. Why is it important? Why are standards important? Well, from a compliance perspective, it supports ensuring compliance and conformance. Additionally, it helps and supports operations by maintaining a safe facility, implementing process safety practices, 
And we all know about liability. We need to minimize those legal liability issues. And those of you who've done audits will know that standards are important because they provide input criteria to the actual audit process. There are many expectations associated with standards, but in principle, they need to be frequently done. The frequency is important. That's the identification, interpretation, implementation and monitoring of changes. Standards do change on a year-by-year -year basis, some on a five-year cycle, so it's important to review this. And individualism. What we mean is every facility will have its own specific DNA, so it should be custom-made to that facility, especially where staff are more familiar with specific requirements and regulations. Other expectations include start early, nobody likes surprises, especially as it becomes expensive to rectify. And management of change, acronyms here, MOC, please do dive into the abbreviations and definitions document for any of these uh, abbreviations that come up. Management of change is important because by addressing changes initiated by standards, we need to make sure that we incorporate specific needs. Other expectations? Well, we need to monitor compliance and establish actions that must be taken. Competency is also very important in terms of standards. It, they, they need to be reviewed and done by someone with a technical background and done by someone who's familiar with the relevant regulations. Records are very important. They're the lifeblood of the organization in terms of showing compliance. Accurate, complete, up-to-date and accessible set of documents and data is very, very important to show compliance that the company has. Let's now look at application focusing on specifics. We need to maintain a dependable practice when it comes to standards. In other words, it's reliable and sustainable. Some of the key factors to consider are ensure consistent implementation of the standards system, identify when standards compliance is needed, and involve competent personnel. Ensure that standards compliance practices remain effective. Also in terms of application, we need to conduct compliance work activities. Key factors to consider, we need to provide appropriate inputs to standards activities, conduct compliance assurance activities, determine compliance data periodically, and review the applicability of standards as new information or changes arise. We mentioned this earlier in terms of keeping the standards evergreen and keeping a review process. And we need to provide a status report to management that we are in compliance. Application factors to consider in terms of following up on decisions, actions and use of compliance results, in other words monitoring, include updating compliance documents and reports as needed, communicating conformance aspects or compliance assurance records to the appropriate parties. This could be internal and external parties. And maintain element work records. Let's visit metrics now. Earlier we discussed dependable aspects in terms of application. Metrics for dependable aspects include looking at a number of new sources standards identified and adopted during the past year. How about the number of people trained on standards activities? And what is the average amount of calendar time taken for a review of the standards? Metrics in terms of developing include the number of existing standards revised per year, the number of meetings regarding standards attended per year, and the number of audits in which personnel participated on standards. And finally, let's look at metrics for monitoring. What are the number of compliance violations per year? The number of non-conformances related to non-regulatory standards. And the average amount of time taken between completing a standard system review and closeout of all follow-up action items. The important thing to remember in, th in terms of a theme for metrics, qualitative and quantitative, and the three applications we looked at, dependable, developing and monitoring, is they play a very key role. What do I mean by that? 
let's revisit the metrics for dependable. If we say quantitative is a red circle, dotted circle, and qualitative is a blue dotted circle, do you recall the three different metrics I put up? Let's look at those three metrics again. They're all quantitative. Number, number, average amount, etc. What about the metrics for developing? Let's revisit that. And guess what? They're all numbers. Again, number, number, and number. So all quantitative. And we had metrics for monitoring. As you would expect, these are also very quantitative. So in conclusion, progress can only be made if progress is measured. Quantitative and qualitative metrics play a big part for dependable, developing, and monitoring. What is competency? Well, competency involves knowledge, skills, and attitudes. It's the ability of a person to do a job properly, and it enables proactive learning. It's closely related to the knowledge and training elements of the risk-based process safety system, or framework. Competency generates new information. Knowledge element allows management. And competency focuses primarily on learning, whereas training supports development. What's the importance of competency? Well, the risk-based process safety competency element supports increasing and sharing process knowledge, new and old. The application of knowledge to situations that help manage risk and improve plant performance. Understanding and interpreting knowledge, it allows making better decisions. And there's an increase in the likelihood that individuals when faced with tough decisions have the knowledge and skills to take the correct actions. You may recall in the process safety management introduction video, I put the slide up where it showed a sliding scale from 1974 to 2010 and a whole raft of incidents. You remember many of these because they were very high profile, specifically Flixborough, uh, Texas City, and also Bunsfield. Well, incidents can be devastating, we know that. And learning must be proactive, taking the initiative. This is important. Lessons can't be forgotten. They have to be a part of the learning process. Increasing the rate of change makes it more difficult to maintain competency. And competent people can transform and manage information into knowledge. Knowledge management and not information management via competent workforce allows greater risk management. Let's look at expectations. Understanding and interpretation of knowledge to enable better decisions and risk management. Information and competency are critical for almost every risk-based process safety element. There is a tangible work product produced by this competency element. Many of you will be familiar with technology manuals. Written documentation incorporating lessons learned and personnel transactions, tangible products. And also another expectation is safe operation and maintenance of facilities. Let's look at application focusing on specifics. We need to maintain a dependable practice, reliable and sustainable. How can we help focus? What can we use as specific for focus? Well, we can establish objectives. We can develop a learning plan and tolerate errors and mistakes, but learn from them. Appoint a champion. Promote a learning organization and identify additional benefits. Application, focusing on specifics to do with maintaining and enhancing. We can appoint a technology steward. Document knowledge. Solicit knowledge from external sources. We can ensure that the information is accessible and apply the knowledge. Provide a structure, update information and push knowledge to appropriate personnel. Plan personnel transitions and promote person-to-person -person contact. 
application focusing on specifics to do with evaluating and sharing of results, we can evaluate existing efforts and ask operations for input. Quite often I've found that specific parts of an operation are not involved in the input process. Applications focusing on specifics to do with adjusting plans, we can periodically, annually, review the status of efforts to promote process safety competency. When we look at dependable and we look at metrics associated with that, typically we can look at comparison of actual versus budgeted spend for activities associated with the execution of the learning plan. We can do personal development plans, known as PDPs, for managers, supervisors, etc. and have any objectives to process safety competency being set. And what is the trend over the time periods? Are there any opinion surveys regarding the effectiveness of programs to promote learning? What does the trend show? Metrics to maintain and enhance. This is a busy slide, so I'll break it as, as best as possible, but you can always pause the video show and capture some information. We can look at incident recurrence. What is the frequency? Is it indicative? What is the number or percentage of technology steward positions? And the ratio of process changes to document changes. Is there a discrepancy? How about time spent by technical stewards in face-to-face -face contact with op units? You may recall the comment earlier about input from operation units. This is a good indicator. Opinion surveys now information is stored and ease of retrieval. Is it indicative? The number of technical questions asked and what is the average response time for technical questions put to either technical steward or a centre of excellence? In terms of frequency, whether incident root cause was unknown to the organisation, physical or chemical. What about the frequency of information access? It could be either manual, website, etc. It's all a part of the learning process. Metrics to evaluate and share include opinion surveys on competency, again trend reviews, and opinion survey on technical service or centres of excellence. And adjusting plans. What can we have as metrics associated with adjusting of plans? We can look at surveys on the usefulness of attending technical meetings. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. If we were to apply that concept of quantitative to qualitative relative to the metrics we've described as being dependable, evaluate, share, adjust plans, maintain and enhance. Let's see how it compares. So here are the dependable aspects. Previously we had the three different metrics associated with dependable. These metrics are all quantitative. How about maintain and enhance? Again, with the exception of one, they all fall under the quantitative. However, the one that I've identified here as being qualitative or quantitative really depends on how you've set it up. You can set these up in a quantitative way or also a qualitative way. Evaluate and share. Again, let's look at the differences. Here we see both the metrics we provided before fall in the category of either quantitative or qualitative. It all depends on how you've set it up. On the subject of adjusting plans, we have that one metric and again it sits in the category of quantitative or qualitative. Surveys on the usefulness of attending technical meetings, you can make it in terms of a percentage or you can have it in terms of feedback from various people who have given the responses. So metrics in conclusion, progress can only be made if progress is measured. When we look at those definitions that we provided or categories for metrics, we're very, it's very easy for us to put it into the quantitative or qualitative framework. 
and emphasis from my perspective is quantitative. Workforce involvement refers to both employees and contractors. Workers at all levels and in all positions in an organisation should have defined roles and responsibilities. The RBPS element facilitates a consultative relationship between management and workers. Workforce involvement is important because the workforce are the most exposed to hazards and risks as they operate and maintain processing units. It's an important input in PSM for design, development, implementation and continuous improvement. For workforce involvement there are expectations. We should have a written plan of action regarding worker participation. We should consult with workers and provide workers and representatives access to relevant information. Looking at application and focusing on specifics and if we want to maintain a dependable practice in other words reliable and sustainable we should ensure consistent implementation and involve competent personnel. Focusing on specifics related to conducting work activities for workforce involvement we should provide the appropriate inputs and apply appropriate work processes and create element work products. To monitor the system for effectiveness we need to ensure that the workforce involvement practices remain effective and workforce involvement to promote the program we need to stimulate workforce participation, publicize success and adopt new workforce participation opportunities. Metrics for dependable. Here are some examples. Percentage of workers trained on workforce involvement and their responsibilities and percentage of managers trained on workforce involvement and their responsibilities. Metrics for activities include what is the rate of submittal of worker suggestions and follow-up aspects and the percentage of workers who have taken part in key defined workforce involvement activities over the last 12 months. For example, suggestions, serving on a risk analysis team or participating in an investigation. Metrics for effectiveness include the number of accepted suggestions that have not been implemented and average stroke maximum delinquency, the percentage of suggestions accepted. Metrics based on promotion include the results of worker attitude surveys with respect to acceptance of process safety responsibilities. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. When we look at it in terms of workforce involvement where we had dependable activities, effectiveness and promotion, we need to look at these in terms of which part they play. Are they quantitative or qualitative? Let's revisit the metrics on dependable. You recall we put up two metrics and both of those are quantitative. Percentage of workers, percentage of managers. How about the metrics for activities? Again you recall that we had what is the rate of submittal of worker suggestions and follow-up aspects and the percentage of workers who have taken part in workforce involvement activities. Both are quantitative. Effectiveness metrics we put up again two and that was the number of accepted suggestions that have not been implemented and average stroke maximum delinquency and the percentage of suggestions accepted. Both quantitative. Promotion metrics slightly different. We have the results of work attitude surveys with respect to acceptance of process safety responsibilities. Depending on how you set this up, you can have it quantitative or qualitative. So in conclusion, for metrics, progress can only be made as progress is measured. Many would be familiar with the strap line you keep using, and it would be emphasized in every course within this series. So our metrics of dependable activities, effectiveness and promotion are all 
quantitative that we've described with the exception of one in promotion. Stakeholders outreach is a process for seeking out individuals or organisations that can be or believe they can be affected by companies' operations and engaging them in a dialogue about process and workplace safety. Bit of a mouthful there, but just focus on the words seeking out. It's about establishing a relationship with community organisations, other companies, professional groups and local or national authorities. And it's about providing accurate information about the company and the products, processes, plans, hazards and risks. Stakeholders outreach is important because it promotes involvement of the facility in the local community. It facilitates access to relevant process and workplace safety information and it facilitates sharing of relevant information and lessons learned with similar facilities internally or externally. And let's not forget that it facilitates communication of information and facility activities that could affect the community. Particularly important when we look at emergency response. Expectations are that we have a successful communication process with relevant stakeholders that build trust and goodwill. We provide a feedback and feed forward process when adverse events or conflicts occur. We need to provide good communication plans, messages, tools, brochures, training materials and records, and also provide an understanding of community concerns and participating in local emergency planning committee activities which can help provide inputs to the organisation's emergency response plan, process, etc. Let's focus on application specifics, particularly maintaining a dependable practice. We need to keep practices effective, ensure consistent implementation and involve competent personnel. In terms of focusing on specifics which relate to identifying communication outreach needs, we need to look at identifying relevant stakeholders and defining appropriate scope. Focusing on specifics to do with activities conducting communication or outreach activities, we need to maintain external relationship, identify appropriate communication pathways and share appropriate information, develop appropriate communication tools. And following through, focusing on application, we can look at follow-up commitments to stakeholders and receive feedback, and share stakeholder concerns with management. We can also look at document outreach encounters. Let's look at metrics to do a dependable. We can look at the number of community advisory panel members that chose to stay involved, the number of complaints received by the facility, how about the percentage of prepared key messages issued that appear in media coverage? Community attitude survey results play a big part. Positive statements about the company made by regulators in public forums. Reduction in the number of activist group complaints, demonstrations made against the company. Requests granted by regulators and the cost associated with regulatory citations. We can also include the cost incurred for communication and outreach training. Metrics for needs, we can include the annual number of inquiries from regulators, the number of information requests from the community, and the number of new or revised communication plans, and the number of new stakeholders identified. Let's look at metrics associated with activities. We can look at the number of community advisory panel meetings and attendance rate, the number of key personnel that have received initial or refresher communications, outreach or crisis management training, the number of outreach activities per month or year. And what about the cost incurred for attendance at industry group meeting and the number of community members attending planned outreach functions such as plant tours or open houses, the number of outreach meetings held 
and the number of press briefings on the company? How about the amount of time spent preparing for and conducting CAP meetings, which is the Community Advisory Panel meetings? And finally, the number of industry group meetings at which company presenters shared significant lessons learned. We have to follow through. If we look at metrics for follow through, we can consider the number of commitments made to the community versus the number of commitments completed, the length of time to respond to community inquiries, and the cost of responding to requests for information, and also the number of commitments made to the community versus the number of commitments completed. And finally, the number of management review meetings held to discuss outreach issues. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. And when we consider those metrics we discussed earlier, we put it in the pots of dependable, needs, activities and follow through. Let's revisit the metrics for dependable. Apologies for this being a busy slide as it was before, but you can see that most of the metrics fall in the red dashed line, which is the quantitative representation. There could be some debate as to some being qualitative, but it really depends on how you set them up. And as you know, my preference is to make it quantitative. Metrics for needs, if we revisit those, the four that we put up before, again fall into the category of being quantitative. The annual number, the number off, the number off, the number of new revised, etc. And metrics for activities, again apologies for a busy slide, but you can see they fall into the category of quantitative. Easy to monitor, easy to measure, relatively and also easy to report on. Follow through metrics that we showed earlier, you can see that the five that we put up fall into the category of quantitative. So in conclusion, and you'll know this strap line as I've used it several times, is progress can only be made if progress is measured. When we looked at the metrics that we put up for dependable, needs, activities and follow through, they fell mainly into the quantitative category. Process safety acknowledgement refers to collection of information. It involves activities associated with compiling, cataloging, and making available a specific set of data that is normally recorded in paper or electronic format. It's important to note that knowledge implies understanding and not simply compiling data Competency plays a big role. Focus on information that can easily be recorded in documents, such as written technical documents and specifications, engineering drawings and calculations, specifications, for example, for design, fabrication, and installation of process equipment. Let's not forget other documents such as material safety data sheets. Process safety knowledge is important because risk management depends on accurate process knowledge. Risk-based process safety can't be efficiently applied without an understanding of risk. And process safety knowledge is a keystone for RBPS. Process safety knowledge also supports other elements in RBPS, for example, procedures, training, asset integrity, management of change and incidents. There are some expectations with process safety knowledge. Development and documentation has to start early. Don't leave it too late. Efforts must continue through the design, hazard review, construction, commissioning and operational phases of the life cycle. And ensure resources are allocated. You should conduct process safety knowledge by collecting and cataloguing hard copy documents that are stored in filing cabinets or libraries, and electronic files or databases maintained on computer networks. Must also make sure that adequate training is provided to staff. Trained on how to access the information, understand the content, and also make a commitment to keep the information current and accurate. Focusing on specifics now, and looking at dependability. We need to ensure consistent implementation, thoroughly document 
chemical reactivity and incompatibility hazard, assign responsibilities to competent personnel and define the scope. Focusing on retrieval, i.e. catalog process knowledge in a manner that facilitates retrieval, we need to make information available and provide structure. We need to protect knowledge from inadvertent loss and store calculations and important design data in central files. And we need to document information in a user-friendly manner. Focusing on protecting and updating now, protect and update process knowledge, we need to control or limit access to out-of-date documents and support efforts to properly manage change and protect against physical or electronic removal or even misfiling, ensure the accuracy of the data and protect against inadvertent changes. Focusing on the use of process knowledge now and personnel should have confidence that the process knowledge is current and accurate and personnel are aware of how to access the process knowledge, documents are accessible and information can be readily located within documents. Let's look at metrics for dependable. We could consider the number of investigations that include an element of discovery. The number of risk assessment recommendations highlighting where the information wasn't available and the number or percent of blank records in the process knowledge database. Metrics for retrieval include the number of risk assessment recommendations where the information was readily available, the results of surveys to determine if users of process knowledge believe it is readily accessible, or the number of instances when maintenance planners or purchasing agents couldn't locate the information and finally, if process knowledge is web-based, the number or percent of dead links. Metrics for protecting and updating can include accuracy of process knowledge during periodic reviews, engineering staff time spent recreating process knowledge, the number of change requests initiated to correct process knowledge, also the number of times during audits or assessments that process knowledge must be retrieved from personnel files, results of random checks of process knowledge files after change requests are closed, the ratio of approved change requests relative to updates in piping and instrumentation diagrams, for example, the results of periodic surveys to determine if users of process knowledge believe that it is current and accurate, and finally, the results of random checks of MSDS files to determine if they're complete, current and accurate. This is a busy slide, but as you can see, there are lots of metrics you can have with regards to protecting and updating process safety knowledge. Looking at metrics for the use of process safety knowledge, we could consider the frequency that process knowledge is accessed, which is far easier to do in a web-based system than it is to look at hard copies. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. When we considered the metrics earlier of dependable, retrievable, protect, update and using, we can see that in the category of dependable, the three metrics that we had were all quantitative. When we look at the metrics for retrieval, we can see that also the metrics again were quantitative. And similarly for protect and update, the metrics were all quantitative with the exception of the three shown on the slide here. Again, as I've emphasized in other courses, it really depends on the user in terms of making it quantitative or qualitative. My preference, as you may know, is to make it quantitative so that we can actually measure progress. In terms of metrics for using, the metric that we did have, the frequency that process knowledge is accessed, is a quantitative measure. A supplemental slide here taken out of CCPS risk-based process safety. Some typical examples of chemical hazards information include physical data, reactivity, corrosive data, industrial hygiene data, etc. All information. Process technology information includes 
flow diagrams, mass and energy balances, uh, description of control system, logic diagram, cause and effect. The list goes on. There's another slide here showing process equipment information. Materials of construction, piping specification, shop fabrication drawings. Okay, the message here is that process knowledge and process safety knowledge is a very, very deep well. And it's important to get a really good handle in terms of managing the information and controlling and disseminating. So in conclusion for metrics, with the categories that we had, looking at quantitative and qualitative. We know that progress can only be made if progress is measured. And therefore, we, the more we add towards a quantitative measure, the easier it is to identify what we need to improve. Now, hazard identification risk analysis encompasses all activities involved in identifying hazards and evaluating risk throughout the life cycle at your facility is to make certain that risks to employees, the public and or the environment, are consistently controlled. And if you've done these before, you know that it typically involves activities associated with compiling, cataloging and making available a specific set of data that is normally recorded in paper or electronic format and also retrievable. Hira studies typically address three main risk questions. Hazard, what can go wrong? Consequences, well, how bad can it be? And likelihood, how often might it happen? Once hazards have been identified and risks analyzed, the acceptability of the risk can be judged. Now, in terms of acceptability, totally different course, but you will typically have a risk ranking matrix within your organization for determining acceptability. Hire is important because to be able to manage risks and determine acceptability, we need to do the identification and assessment piece. It forms a foundation for other process safety management activities. And inaccurate assessments leads to vulnerability and catastrophic events as we've seen in the past with poor risk assessments. There are expectations. Hire reviews are done can be at any stage in a project's life cycle or an operational cycle. Hire studies performed by a team of qualified experts on the process, the materials and the work activities. Typically, the team will involve operating and maintenance personnel early in the review process to identify hazards. And other expectations include approved and accepted actions by management it must be implemented for risk reduction to achieve risk reduction goals. In other words, it's not just an academic exercise. And higher results and records are kept on file and will be communicated to those who may be affected, specifically operational personnel or contractors. Looking at application now and focusing on specifics for maintaining a dependable practice. We need to document the intended risk management system, integrate higher activities into the life cycle of projects or processes, clearly define the analytical scope of hires and assure adequate coverage, ensure consistent implementation and involve competent personnel, verify that higher practices remain effective and make consistent judgments. We also need to determine the physical scope of the risk system and for identifying hazards and evaluating risks, we need to select appropriate HIRA methods, ensure that HIRA reviewers have the appropriate expertise, and gather and use appropriate data to identify hazards and evaluate risk, prepare a thorough risk assessment report and perform risk activities to the appropriate level i.e. relative to risk impact. An application focusing on specifics to do with assessment and decision making, we need to apply the risk tolerance criteria, which is very specific, perhaps your organization, the risk ranking matrix, as it's otherwise known as. You need to select appropriate risk control measures. Focusing on application regarding follow-up and assessment results, we need to communicate important results to management, 
document the residual risk, resolve recommendations and track completion of actions, maintain risk assessment records, communicate results internally and also communicate results externally. For those who want to know a little bit more about documenting the residual risk, you may need to refer to your internal procedures regarding risk assessments and risk ranking matrix, the before mitigation measures and after mitigation measures. Metrics to do are dependable. You could consider reviewing the number of hires that are overdue. What are the number of audit findings? How many qualified hire leaders, scribes and participants are in your organisation? What is the percentage of intended revalidations that requires a study to be completely redone? And what is the demand on the hire team and their efficiency? Metrics for the identification and evaluation, you could consider the number of hirers scheduled per month or year, the time required to issue a hire report after completing the hire study, and what is the frequency of the techniques used? In other words, is there a bias? In my experience, sometimes you see a bias towards the ones where there's less time involved in the actual review process. Metrics regarding assessment and decision making, you could consider what are the number of recommendations per study or per year, what is the average number of recommendations per revalidation, and the ratio of actual losses relative to the risk tolerance criteria that has been established for making decisions. Is it a fair representation? And the percentage distribution of recommendation in categories. In other words, are they administrative, engineered controls, passive engineering controls, or inherently safer alternatives? And follow-up metrics include reviewing the number of recommendations unresolved by their due date, either overdue. What is the percentage of repeat recommendations? Is there evidence of management exceptions to the risk criteria? In other words, accepting a higher risk. And what percentage of recommendations in a hire study are rejected by management? What is the average time required for completing corrective records? Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dash line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dash line. And if we look at the various pots that we put them in earlier, dependable, evaluate identification, assessment decision making and follow up, if we revisit the metrics for dependable, you'll notice that the five that we put up fall into the quantitative category. And likewise, metrics for the identification and evaluation, also the three that we put up fall into the quantitative criteria. Metrics regarding assessment and decision making, the four metrics that we put up earlier also fall into the quantitative criteria and the follow-up metrics that we had, they also fall into the quantitative. Procedures can generally be divided into three categories. There are operating procedures, which are activities that generally involve producing a product. There's maintenance procedures, which involve testing, inspecting, calibrating, maintaining or repairing equipment, and safe work procedures. These are often supplemented with permits, a checklist that includes an authorization step. It fills in the gap between the other two sets of procedures. Operating procedures are written instructions that are stored electronically and printed on demand. They generally provide a list of the steps for a given task and describe which steps are to be performed and when. Operating procedures describe the process, hazards, tools, protective equipment and controls that are necessary to allow operators to understand the hazards, verify controls are in place and process response requirements. Normally Operating procedures are used to control activities such as product changeover, periodic cleaning of process equipment, preparing equipment for certain maintenance activities and other activities routinely performed by operators. CCPS's RBPS focus is on operating procedures for startup, operation, shutdown 
emergency response and procedures complementing safe work and asset integrity. Operating procedures are important because without written procedures, there's no assurance that the intended procedures and methods are used by each operator. And there's no consistency in that an individual operator will consistently execute a particular task in the intended manner. Operating procedures are also important and critical for safe operation, maintenance of equipment, information on deviations and warnings, instructions for troubleshooting and emergency response. There are expectations. They should be developed before an operation is performed. It should establish a safe operating envelope and any limiting conditions for operation. You find a definition for safe operating envelope in the abbreviations and uh, definitions document, which you can download. And procedures should be updated when relative changes occur. Other expectations include, they should be reviewed periodically to ensure that they remain valid, and they should provide critical information to the training element they have to involve key personnel in the consultation process, i.e. operators, maintenance, process engineers, technicians, supervisors and managers as examples. From an application perspective, for focusing on having a dependable practice for operating procedures, we can establish management controls, and we can have controlling documents and controlling procedure format and content. If we were to focus on identifying what operating procedures are needed, we can conduct a task analysis. We can determine what procedures are needed and their appropriate level of detail. And address all operating modes, including non-routine and abnormal conditions. With regards to focusing on specifics for developing procedures, there's quite a few items here, so we'll go through it slowly. Use an appropriate format. We can interlink related procedures. Address limiting conditions for operation. We can provide clear, concise instructions. And supplement procedures with checklists. We can make effective use of pictures and diagrams. Validate procedures and verify that actual practice conforms to the intended practice. Develop written procedures to control temporary or non-routine operations. Ensure that the procedures describe the expected system response how to determine if a step or task has been done properly and possible consequences associated with errors or emissions. And finally, address safe operating limits and consequences of deviation from safe operating limits. Focusing on procedures to improve human performance, we can use the procedures when training. We can ensure that procedures are available and also Hold the organization accountable for consistently following procedures, not just people. Focusing on ensuring that procedures are maintained, we can manage the changes. We can correct errors and emissions in a timely manner and periodically review all operating procedures. Metrics associated with dependable we can take into account recording and reviewing the number of standard operating procedures updated per year or staff hours spent updating the procedures. We can also look at what is the amount of time staff spend reviewing and approving procedures. Looking into metrics for identifying requirements, we can look into the number of units that have completed a task analysis to identify procedural requirements and if task analyses are periodically updated or revalidated and they are in compliance with revalidation schedules that has been approved by the organization. Metrics for development, we could consider reviewing the number of audit or assessment findings on procedures that have missing information on either the element or tasks. We can look at the number of management change authorizations issued for each unit per year 
following permits for temporary operations. In other words, issuing a temporary management of change authorization rather than a temporary or permanent procedure. Metrics for human performance improvement. We could look at reviewing the number of incident or deficiency reports related to procedures that were unclear, not available or not widely understood. We can look at the percentage of procedures that are annotated in the field, an ad hoc approach. The number of incident investigations that recommend changes to procedures. And the fraction of operators who believe that procedures are current and accurate. There's also the percent of changes to procedures that are not covered by an MOC authorization, that's management of change. Metrics associated with maintained, we could consider reviewing the number of procedures that are past due for review, in other words, overdue. And we could also look at what is the mean time to correct or update procedures. What fraction of procedures are clear, concise, and include all of the required content? What is the average age of procedures? Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. Let's continue with the theme of quantitative and qualitative with regards to metrics. We covered metrics in the various pots which were dependable, developed, human performance improvement, identification and maintain. If we now look at the metrics for dependable, with that approach of dotted red lines and blue lines, you can see that they fall into the quantitative category. Metrics for identifying requirements, we had two. One of them we can say is quantitative. The other one can be either quantitative or qualitative, depending on how you set the system up. The metrics for development, they were quantitative. Metrics for human performance improvement, they were all also quantitative. We had metrics for maintaining as well, and they were all quantitative. In conclusion, the metrics that we had fell predominantly into the quantitative category. Safe work practices help control hazards and manage risk associated with non-routine work, that is, any activity not fully described in an operating procedure. For example, breaking a connection to remove and calibrate a pressure transmitter. Safe working practices are often supplemented with permits. In other words, a checklist that includes an authorization step. It fills in the gap between operating and maintenance procedures, which we covered in the previous element titled operating procedures. Safe working practices are important because non-routine work increases risks and it's a critical element in the management of industrial safety. There are expectations. Policies and practices are developed at the corporate level and typically states which activities are permitted with no special controls, which activities require special permits and which activities are prohibited. Other expectations include Procedures and permits used by operating facilities on a day-to-day -day that specify how work is to be executed are developed at the local level by facilities. And permits are issued and authorised by trained operators, supervisors or safety specialists. Expectations also include a shared responsibility between operators, maintenance personnel and contractors who perform the work and safe working practices should complement operating and maintenance procedures. The safe work practice system should be described in a facility-wide policy and addresses management system issues such as the scope of the safe work element, roles and responsibilities, and the relationship between safe work procedures, permits, and procedures developed for other RBPS elements. Focusing on having a dependable practice for safe work practices, we can consider defining the scope, specify when in the facility's life cycle the safe work practices apply, ensure consistent implementation, involve competent personnel.
for effectively controlling non-routine work activities, we can train employees and contractors. We can enforce the use of safe work procedures, permits and other standards. Control access to particularly hazardous areas and review completed permits and also develop safe work procedures, permits, checklists and other written standards. Metrics for dependable. We can include compliance with the training plan for activities related to the safe work element and progress towards implementing a new safe work practice or making significant improvements to the existing system. We can also look at the percentage of permits correctly completed. For metrics associated with control for non-routine work activities, we can look at the number of injuries related to non-routine work, the number of near-miss incidents related to non-routine work, the number or percentage of safe work practices that are past due for periodic review, the frequency of improper shift-to-shift -shift handoffs. We can also look at unsafe conditions or permit violations observed during routine audits on a consistent basis. The number of causal factors identified by incident investigation teams related to failures to properly apply or follow a safe work permit. And the average time spent issuing a work permit, for example, Total time spent issuing permits divided by the number of permits issued. Other metrics for control for non-routine work activities. We could consider the percent of scheduled job observations or audits performed, the number or percent of safe work practices revised each year, the average time between a request for a permit and when it's issued, and the staff hours spent writing, reviewing and approving safe work practices. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. We discuss metrics in two categories, dependable and controllable. The dependable metrics that we had, which there was three of them, were all quantitative. Some of it is qualitative, but it's easy to make them quantitative. The metrics for control for non-routine work activities, in the first slide, we had seven metrics and they were all quantitative. And the metrics for controlling non-routine work activities in the second slide, we had four and they were also all quantitative. Asset integrity and reliability activities, which include inspections and tests, ensure that important equipment will be suitable for its intended application throughout its life cycle. The asset integrity and reliability scope within RBPS includes physical equipment, in other words, it provides containment, and safety or utility systems designed to prevent or mitigate LOPC effect or sudden release of energy. LOPC standing for loss of primary containment and you find the definitions and abbreviations in the document which you can download. The asset integrity and reliability element activities focus on preventing a catastrophic release of a hazardous material or a sudden release of energy and ensuring high availability or dependability of critical safety or utility systems to prevent or mitigate the effects of these types of events. Asset integrity and reliability is important because it helps to ensure that equipment is properly designed, installed in accordance with specifications and remains fit for use until retired. Asset integrity and reliability is also important to ensure that equipment will be suitable for its intended application throughout its life and maintaining containment of hazardous materials and ensuring safety systems work when needed. These are two of the primary responsibilities for any facility. The expectations from asset integrity and reliability is that it should be part of a day-to-day -day operation involving operators, maintenance employees, inspectors, contractors, engineers and others involved in designing, specifying, 
installing, operating or maintaining equipment. And it should also be equipment and systems are properly designed, fabricated and installed. And the equipment is operated within design limits and extends throughout the life of the facility. Other expectations include that the inspection, testing, preventive maintenance, which is ITPM tasks, are conducted by trained and qualified individuals using approved procedures and completed as scheduled. That repair work conforms to design codes, engineering standards and manufacturer's recommendations and that appropriate actions are taken to address deficiencies regardless of how they're discovered. Focusing on having a dependable practice for asset integrity and reliability, we can consider developing a written program description or policy. We can determine the scope of the asset integrity element. We can have base design and inspection testing and preventative maintenance tasks on standards integrate the asset integrity element with other goals, update practices based on new knowledge, and involve competent personnel. Focusing on identifying equipment systems that are within the scope of the AI program and also assigning ITPM tasks, we can develop an ITPM program. We can identify equipment and systems for inclusion in the asset integrity element, and update the ITPM plan when equipment conditions change. Focusing on developing and maintaining knowledge, skills, procedures and tools for asset integrity and reliability, we can ensure that inspectors hold appropriate certifications, provide the right tools, train employees and contractors, develop procedures for inspection, test, repair and other critical maintenance activities. Focusing on specifics to ensure continued fitness for purpose, we can look at conducting initial inspections and tests as part of plant commissioning. We can plan, control and execute maintenance activities. Execute calibration, adjustment, preventative maintenance and, and repair activities. We can conduct tests and inspections during operations ensure the quality of repair parts and maintenance materials and ensure that overhauls, repairs and tests do not undermine safety. Focusing on addressing equipment failures and deficiencies, we can promptly address conditions that can lead to failure, review test and inspection reports, examine results to identify any broader issues, plan maintenance and repair activities and investigate chronic failures using a structured methodology. Focusing on analysing data, we can look at collecting and analysing data for a start. We can adjust inspection frequencies and methods, conduct additional inspections or tests as needed, archive the data and plan replacements or other corrective actions. If we were to consider metrics for dependable, we could display a simple chart showing which facilities or units have fully implemented specific programs or practices. Metrics for identifying requirements, we could look at the number of equipment items included in the asset integrity program and the number of ITPM work orders per month or quarter that apply to equipment that is no longer present at the facility. Metrics for looking at development and maintenance, we could consider the number of inspectors or maintenance employees holding each type of required certification. Metrics associated with continued fitness for purpose, we can look at the number or percentage of overdue ITPM tasks, the number of emergency unplanned repair work orders per month, and the total number of deferred repairs such as known deficiencies that will be addressed at the next turnaround or shutdown and the work order backlog for the inspection group in other words planned activities that are not yet past due and the total time charged to ITPM tasks each month or quarter. Metrics for failures and deficiencies we could consider the average time to address or correct deficiencies 
the number of temporary repairs currently in service, deferred maintenance items. And metrics for analysis, we could consider equipment availability or reliability. We could look at the number or percentage of ITPM tasks that uncover a failure. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. If we revisit the metrics that we establish for the various categories of dependable, develop, failure, deficiency, analyze and so on, let's revisit them one by one. For dependable, we had one metric and you could consider it as being quantitative or qualitative depending on how you set this up. Metrics for identifying requirements, there were two, and they were quantitative. Metrics for development and maintenance, there was one metric, and that was quantitative. Metrics for continued fitness for purpose, we had five metrics, and they were quantitative. And metrics for failure deficiency, we had two metrics, both quantitative. And finally, metrics for analysis, we had two metrics, both were quantitative. Contractor management is a system of controls to ensure that contracted services support both safe facility operations and the company's process safety and personal safety performance goals or obligations. This element addresses the selection, acquisition, use and monitoring of such contracted services. It's important because using contractors allows a company to access specialised expertise not continuously required, supplement limited company resources during periods of unusual demand and increase headcount without the long-term commitment. But there's a drawback. Contractors place personnel who are unfamiliar with the facilities, hazards and protective systems into locations where they could be affected by process hazards and vice versa. Contractor management allows a company to ensure that contracted services don't add to or increase facility operational risks. Expectations. It doesn't cover procurement of goods and supplies or off-site equipment fabrication functions. These are covered by the asset integrity and quality assurance function. Contractor management begins well before any contract is issued. And training requirement is defined. Orientation and training of contractor personnel must be done before they begin any work. The delegation of authority and responsibilities between the contractor, corporate and facility personnel are clearly set out before any work begins. And don't forget contractors providing simpler and more routine tasks, for example, cleaning. And you're expected to carry out periodic monitoring of contractor safety performance and auditing of contractor management systems. You also need to review findings for determining retention. Focusing on specifics, having a dependable practice for contractor management, we can ensure consistent implementation, identify when contractor management is needed, involve competent personnel and ensure that practices remain effective. Focusing on conducting work activities, we can fulfill company responsibilities with respect to safety. We can ensure that contractor personnel are properly trained and establish expectations, roles and responsibilities for safety program implementation and performance. Focusing on monitoring contractor management system for effectiveness, we can audit the contractor selection process, monitor and evaluate contractor safety performance. Metrics for dependable. We can consider the frequency of waivers on qualification requirements, past safety performance or deviations from current safety program. We can also look at the percentage of contracted firms based upon post-job evaluation who would be considered for future contracts. 
metrics for activities, we can consider the percentage of required contractor training sessions conducted on schedule. We can look at the frequency and or percentage attendance at contractor safety meetings. The percentage of contractor related incidents or near misses that reviewed using root cause analysis and the number of safety improvement suggestions submitted by contractor personnel. Let's not also forget the number of open contractor safety suggestions, in other words, those not yet resolved by a company representative or average age for unresolved suggestions. Metrics for effectiveness, we can consider relevant statistics monitoring compliance with safe work practice procedures for contractor involved jobs, the percentage of incidents and near misses investigated by the facility that had root causes related to contractor activities, and the number or frequency of deviations in job safety evaluations, field inspections, audits of safe work practice implementation, or other safety related audits, and safety performance metrics for contractor companies. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. If we look at the theme for metrics on the various categories we had of dependable activities and effectiveness, when we look at the dependable metrics, we can conclude that the two we had were quantitative. And with regards to metrics for activities, again, the metrics that we had were all quantitative. Training is the practical instruction provided pre-job or pre-task on specific procedures or methods that should be followed. Performance assurance is the process whereby workers demonstrate that they have understood the training and can apply it in practical situations. It's an ongoing process to make sure that workers meet performance standards and to identify where additional training is required. Training and performance assurance is important because it enables workers to meet some minimum initial performance standards, it supports maintaining workers' proficiency, and it provides greater confidence that tasks are completed in accordance with accepted procedures and practices. There are expectations. It may be conducted in a classroom or workplace and conducted by subject matter experts or outside specialists. Training is completed before being allowed to work independently in a specific job position. And refresher training is provided on an ongoing basis as needed. Other expectations include that training is based on needs analysis that define the minimum acceptable knowledge, skills and abilities required for a worker in a specific position. The training program bridges the gap between what is demanded or expected of a qualified job applicant and what is required to succeed in a specific job. Performance assurance process tests trained workers initially and periodically to make sure they have the necessary knowledge, skills and abilities and are qualified to work independently. Focusing on having a dependable practice for training and performance assurance, we can consider validating program effectiveness, defining roles and responsibilities and control documents. Focusing on identifying what training is needed, we can consider conducting a job or task analysis, determine what training is needed, manage the changes, group training into logical programs, and determine minimum requirements for essential elements for job candidates. Focusing on specifics to provide effective training, we can consider timing, develop or procure training materials, interweave related topics and ensure that training is available. Focusing on monitoring worker performance, we can look at qualifying workers initially, 
testing workers periodically and reviewing all qualifications requirements periodically. Metrics for dependable. We can consider the percentage of incidents where training and performance aspects were the root causes. We can look at the number of exceptions or issues related to training requirements, the number of subject matter experts providing training, how about the number of qualified personnel in defined process safety management roles, and the percentage change in the training budget. And finally, percentage of course deliveries audited or reviewed. Metrics related to identification for training and performance assurance, we can consider the number of workers in specific categories with training overdue, the percentage of workers who've missed a scheduled training session, the percentage of workers with overdue training, the percentage of training sessions that are offered on schedule or as planned, and the number of training sessions scheduled and by the type of training. Metrics for effectiveness, we can consider the percentage of workers who believe the training is appropriate and effective, the time spent training individuals, shifts, departments and job functions, the average test scores for classes individuals, shifts, departments and job functions, and the time spent on computer-based training modules. Metrics for monitoring, we can look at the percentage of workers who require remedial training, percentage of workers who miss a particular test question, the percentage of workers who complete any tests in the training module, and the number of errors during simulator training, if that specifically applies to your organization. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. Looking at the metrics and the theme in terms of quantitative and qualitative for the various categories we've assigned, of dependable, identifiable, effectiveness and monitoring, the metrics for dependable were all quantitative. Metrics for identification also were all quantitative. And similar story for metrics for effectiveness and also metrics for monitoring. In conclusion, the metrics we have were all quantitative. Management change is a very important subject. I'm sure many of you have had involvement with it. It's a critical interface for ongoing risk assessments, a checkpoint. It helps ensure that changes do not introduce new hazards or unknowingly increase the risk of existing hazards. Also, don't forget the importance of management of organizational change, MOOC. MOOC and process safety culture are closely linked and critical for progressing the process safety competency element. Management of change is important because it provides a gateway process, the critical interface for ongoing risk assessment checkpoint. If a proposed modification is made to a hazardous process without appropriate review, the risk of a process safety accident could increase significantly this is a quote from CCPS RBPS 2007 publication. There are expectations for a management of change process. The MOC procedure must clearly define requirements. It must be done throughout the process life cycle. And it must be done for real changes, i.e. not for replacements in kind. And whilst individuals may originate change requests, only qualified personnel review the request and approve. Other expectations include a variety of personnel with a relevant skill set involved as part of the change management review and approval process, and only approved change requests are sanctioned, i.e. part of a go-no-go -no -go process. And there has to be an MOC tracking in place for follow-up, actions tracking, etc. Focusing on having a dependable practice for management of change, we can consider establishing consistent implementation, 
involve competent personnel, and keep management of change practices effective, focusing on identifying potential change situations. We can look at defining the scope of the MOC system and manage all sources of change. Focusing on evaluating possible impacts, we can look at providing appropriate input information to manage the changes, apply appropriate technical rigour for the MOC review process, and ensure that management of change reviewers have the appropriate expertise and necessary tools, and also support. If we now focus on deciding whether to allow the change, we can look at authorising the changes, and ensuring that change authorisers address important issues. We need to also focus on completing follow-up activities. We can update records, we can communicate changes to personnel, enact risk control measures, and maintain MOC records. Metrics for dependable, we can include the number of MOCs performed each month, the average backlog of management of changes or active MOCs, the average amount of calendar time taken between MOC request and authorization, the monthly average in the percentage of work requests classified as a change, the average number of staff hours per MOC from the time the MOC was created until the time the MOC was approved for implementation, the percentage or variation in the number of changes processed on an emergency basis, and the percentage of personnel involved in the MOC system who believe the system is effective, and finally, the difference between the percentages of senior managers and routine users who believe the MOC program or process is effective. Metrics for identification, we could look at the percentage of work orders or requests that were misclassified as replacement in kind or RICs, or were not classified and were really changes, or the ratio of identified undocumented changes to the number of changes processed by the MOC program. Metrics for evaluating impacts. Let's look at the percentage of changes that were reviewed within the MOC system but were reviewed incorrectly, and the percentage of recent changes that involved the use of backup MOC personnel. For approval, we could consider the percentage of changes that were properly evaluated but didn't have the necessary authorization signatures on the change control document. And follow-up metrics, we can look at the percentage of MOCs for which the drawings or procedures weren't updated, the percentage of MOCs reviewed that weren't properly documented, and the percentage of MOCs in which participants weren't informed and or were not trained. And finally, the percentage of temporary management of changes for which the temporary conditions weren't corrected or restored to the original state at the deadline. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dash line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dash line. Continuing with the theme of quantitative and qualitative for metrics for management of change in the various categories we had, dependable, identifiable, evaluate, approve and follow up. Metrics for dependable, they all fell into the quantitative category. And similarly, metrics for identification all fell into the quantitative category. The evaluate impacts metrics, guess what? Quantitative. And the metrics for approval, also quantitative. Follow-up metrics, as one would expect, quantitative. So in conclusion, for the various categories of metrics that we had, and we looked at it quantitatively and qualitative, having quantitative metrics is always much more beneficial for an organisation to review and ensure alignment at the end of the year or on a needs basis. Operational readiness ensures that shutdown processes are verified to be in a safe condition for restart. 
It ensures that startups from all types of shutdown conditions have been taken into consideration. It's precautionary. Other processes may have been shut down for administrative reasons, such as a lack of product demand, or for reasons unrelated to production at all. Operational readiness typically takes into account the length of time the process was in the shutdown condition, may even have been mothballed for an extended period, and the type of work to be conducted on the process, for example, possibly involving line breaking during the shutdown period. And it may be shut down only briefly, while others may have undergone a lengthy maintenance modification outage. Operational readiness is important because experience has shown that the frequency of incidents is higher during process transitions such as startups, and incidents have often resulted from the physical process conditions not being exactly as they were intended for safe operation. There are expectations, of course and it should be conducted prior to start up on new processes, should be conducted on existing processes that were shut down for any reason, and it requires authorization and approval prior to commencement of operations. It involves the relevant people with the appropriate skill set for the review process. Other expectations include that reviews should provide assurance that construction and equipment of a process are in accordance with design specifications, an appropriate risk analysis has been performed, adequate safety, operating, maintenance and emergency procedures are in place, and that training has been completed for all workers who may affect the process. And let's not forget that modified processes have undergone a management of change review. Focusing on a dependable practice for operational readiness, we need to ensure consistent implementation, involve competent personnel, and determine types of and triggers for the readiness practice, determine the scope of readiness reviews, and ensure that readiness practices remain effective. Focusing on conducting appropriate readiness reviews as needed, we need to provide the appropriate inputs. We need to create work element products and involve, of course, appropriate resources and personnel. Apply an appropriate work process and perform element work in a diligent manner. Focusing on making startup decisions based upon readiness results, we need to consider important issues affecting the startup and communicate decisions and actions from the readiness reviews. Focusing on follow-up decisions, actions and the use of readiness results, we need to enact risk control measures, maintain element work records and update process safety knowledge and records. Dependable metrics can include the number of incidents that occur during startup, the duration of startup, number of spurious shutdowns after startup, the amount of off spec product or loss of raw material as a result of startup problems, number of improperly assembled pieces of equipment found during readiness reviews, and the number of personnel trained prior to startup. Let's not forget the staff hours expended on readiness reviews and the number of people trained per year on readiness. Metrics for reviews, we can include the number of startups for which readiness reviews were not performed, or the number of readiness reviews performed. Metrics on decision making, we can consider the number of startups deferred as a result of problems found during readiness reviews, and the number of readiness reviews for which authorizations to restart were not found. Follow-up metrics and use, we could consider the number of issues during startup that should have been discovered during the readiness reviews, the number of action items overdue, and the time from readiness review to completion of all action items. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line 
and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. Following on from the theme of quantitative and qualitative metrics, you may recall we looked at metrics in dependable, review, follow-up use and decision making. Let's revisit the dependable metrics. And the metrics we presented were all quantitative. The metrics that we presented for review were also all quantitative. Metrics for decision making, again quantitative. And metrics for the follow-up and use were all quantitative. Conduct of operations is the execution of operational and management tasks in a deliberate and structured manner. It's also sometimes called operational discipline or formality of operations and is closely tied to an organization's culture. It's a pursuit of excellence in the performance of every task and workers are expected to perform alert be thoughtful and knowledgeable with sound judgment plus accountability. Conduct of operations is important because human performance is critical for any process safety program. It applies everywhere, from the boardroom to the plant floor, and it's an ongoing commitment to reliable operations. There are, of course, expectations and there should be a policy in place describing overall expectations for worker conduct and specific procedures and goals for implementing policies. It requires defined framework of controls to ensure that tasks are performed reliably and workers, employees and contractors are included. Overall responsibility rests with the facility manager but operations must not tolerate deviations from approved procedures. Other expectations are that the HR group, Human Resources Group, is involved because it includes fitness for duty, progressive discipline, salary, bonus and retention decisions. There must be a clear chain of command, defined authority and accountability for reliable work performance. It applies to all work activities not just those of the operations department, and management must lead by example. Focusing on a dependable practice for conduct of operations, we need to have defined roles and responsibilities, establish standards for performance, and validate the program effectiveness. Focusing on control of operational activities, we need to follow written procedures, follow safe work practices, use qualified workers, formalize communications between shifts, adhere to safe operating limits and limiting conditions for operation. We need to assign adequate resources and formalize communications between workers. We need to control access and occupancy and of course formalize communications between work groups as well. Focusing on controlling the status of systems and equipment, we need to formalize equipment stroke asset ownership and access protocols, maintain good housekeeping, maintain lighting, monitor equipment status, maintain labeling, and of course, maintain instruments and tools. Focusing on developing required skills and behaviors for conduct of operations, we need to emphasize observation and attention to detail, promote a questioning learning attitude, establish standards of conduct, train workers to recognize hazards, and also train workers to self-check and peer check. Focusing on monitoring organizational performance for conduct of operations, we need to maintain accountability, strive to continuously improve, maintain fitness for duty, conduct field inspections and correct deviations immediately. Metrics for dependable, we can include the number of incidents with operational issues, the number of qualified personnel in defined roles, what is the progress towards performance goals and let's not forget staff turnover rates. Metrics for controlling activities, we can include the incident rate related to shortcuts, 
the number of human machine interface issues and or near miss reports, the number of incidents during which safe operating limits were exceeded. How about the number of visitors to the control room? Number of labour hours per unit of product? And the number of incidents attributed to trainees? Metrics to control equipment and system. We can look at the number of nuisance and always on alarms. The number of non-routine and emergency maintenance work orders. The number of inspection deficiencies related to labelling. The number of inspection deficiencies related to lighting. How about the audit findings related to inoperable instruments and tools? Number of access permits issued. Number of missed surveillance rounds. The number of incomplete shift logs or report. Average time to resolve off normal findings. And the number of housekeeping audits and their scores. Number of work orders attributed to equipment abuse. And finally, the average time to complete repairs on the human machine interface issues. There are several here and apologies for it being a busy slide, but it's to give you a theme, uh, an overview on the metrics you could have for controlling equipment and systems for conduct of operations. Metrics related to skills behavior, we could look at the number of incidents caused by a lack of self-checking or peer review, the number of times workers are challenged to solve what if problems, the number of incidents involving disruptive personnel behavior, percentage of overtime hours, absenteeism, and the average time required to complete required reading. Metrics for monitoring, we could include the number of unplanned safety system activations for valid reasons, the frequency of communication of progress towards goals, the number of unplanned shutdowns, the number of disciplinary actions, number of manager inspections of work locations, number of unplanned safety system activations for invalid reasons, the percentage of manager inspections delegated to subordinates, and the percentage of workers failing random substance abuse tests. In the metrics just presented now, there are quite a few, and apologies if the slides were busy, but it, again, as I emphasize, it's important to get the message on metrics across. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. Continuing the theme on metrics of quantitative and qualitative and the metrics we had in the various categories, if we revisit the metrics for dependable, they were all quantitative. Control activities metrics were also all quantitative. And metrics for control equipment and systems were again, there were quite a few of them, but going back and looking at them again, they were all quantitative. And metrics for skills and behaviours, you may recall it was a busy slide, but the metrics that we had all fell into the category of quantitative. Metrics for monitor, again, they were all quantitative. Well, we all know emergencies provide little or no warning lead time. There is little chance or opportunity to develop, update or revise plans. And responders face choosing actions based on a range of pre-planned response options. Response options are typically limited by personnel, their training, equipment, communication protocols and external support. Emergency management is important because consequences can be significantly reduced with an effective emergency planning and response process. It extends beyond just putting out the fire. It saves lives, protects property and the environment. And also it reassures stakeholders that the facility is well managed and should be allowed to continue to operate. There are expectations with emergency management processes. It should be performed by specialists, internal and external. It should be the first line of defense, ops group, i.e. shutting down, process isolation and so on. Emergency management activities are done well in advance of an incident and covers typically 
planning and training, drills and exercises which are typically annually and at the facility and in the community where the accident might occur. It also covers actual responses and coordination with local authorities. Other expectations for emergency management includes planning, providing resources, practicing the process, and training or informing employees, contractors and neighbours and local authorities on what to do, notification and reporting. And it should also include stakeholder communication. Focusing on a dependable practice for emergency management, we should develop a written programme designate an owner and define roles and responsibilities, define the scope of the programme and of course involve competent personnel. Focusing on being prepared and prepare for emergencies, we need to look at identifying accident scenarios based on hazards, assess credible accident scenarios, select planning scenarios, plan defensive response actions, and provide physical facilities and equipment. We need to maintain and test facilities and equipment, plan communications, inform and train all personnel, periodically review emergency response plans, and train the emergency response team, the ERT members. We need to determine when unit operator response is appropriate, and we need to, of course, make sure we develop written emergency response plans, plan offensive response and assign adequate resources. A very busy slide and apologies in advance, but you can see there are lots to focus on when we're preparing for emergencies. Focusing on periodically testing the adequacy of emergency response plans and level of preparedness, we can conduct emergency evaluation emergency response drills, we can conduct tabletop exercises, Practice crisis communication. Critique exercises, drills and actual responses. Conduct assessments and audits. And finally, address the findings and recommendations. Continuing with the theme for metrics and looking at dependable metrics, we can look at the number of meetings with local emergency responders regarding the emergency response plan, the number of meetings with the community regarding how they will be notified of an emergency and what they should do if they are notified. When we're looking at metrics for prepare, we can look at the number of trained emergency response team members on each shift, the number or percentage of units that have up-to-date plans, the number of errors or omissions in the emergency response plan that were discovered during drills and training, we can look at the percentage of preventive maintenance work orders for emergency response equipment that are passed due, the number or percentage of emergency response plans that are passed due periodic review, percentage of failed tests or inspections of emergency response equipment, and finally we can look at supply status for emergency response team consumables. Testing metrics we could consider could include number of changes to the emergency response tactics or logistics based on critiques of drills or other exercises, the results of opinion surveys among operators regarding their perception of the unit or the facility state of preparedness for emergencies, the percentage of emergency response team members who are up to date on emergency responder training requirements, and the fraction of drills that are conducted as scheduled. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dash line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dash line. Continuing with the theme of metrics being quantitative and qualitative, if we look at the three categories of metrics we've defined of dependable, being prepared and test metrics, the dependable metrics we had fell into the quantitative category. Metrics for being prepared were also all quantitative. And test metrics, as one would expect, were all quantitative. Incident investigation is a process for reporting, tracking and investigating incidents. Incident investigations also manages the resolution and documentation of recommendations 
that are generated by the investigations. Incident investigations include a formal process for investigating incidents, including staffing, performing, documenting and tracking investigations of process safety related incidents. And it also includes the trending of incident and incident investigation data to identify recurring incidents. Incident investigation is important because it's a way of learning from incidents that occur. It's also important for communicating lessons learned to both internal personnel and other stakeholders to avoid potential risks and or repeats. There are expectations with incident investigations. It should be conducted whenever and wherever incidents occur. It should never be done remotely. It's rarely effective. It should be carried out by personnel who have formal training in incident investigations or root cause analysis techniques, known as RCA. And personnel throughout the company must provide assistance to the investigation team. And incidents with potential regulatory impact must also involve the legal department. Other expectations include that it may also involve the company's public affairs group as the focal point for communications to the media and other external organisations. It's company specific with regard to what combinations of consequences and frequencies are appropriate to trigger an incident investigation. For example, it may involve formal investigation like a root cause analysis, less formal investigations known as apparent cause analysis, and trending of incident data with no immediate investigations performed. If we were to focus on maintaining a dependable incident reporting and investigation practice, of course we need to involve competent personnel. We need to monitor incident investigation practices for effectiveness and define an appropriate scope for the incident investigation element. Focusing on identifying potential incidents for investigation, we need to ensure that all incidents are reported and we need to initiate investigations promptly. We were to focus on using appropriate techniques to investigate incidents, we need to interface with the emergency management element, we need to use effective data collection methods, use appropriate techniques for data analysis, develop effective recommendations, and investigate causes to an appropriate depth to uncover the root causes. Demand technical rigour in the investigation process and provide investigation personnel with the appropriate expertise and tools and let's not also forget support. Focusing on documenting incident investigation results, we need to provide clear linking between causes and recommendations. And to follow up through on results of investigations, we need to resolve the recommendations, communicate findings internally and communicate findings externally. We also need to maintain incident investigation records. Focusing on trend data to identify repeat incidents that warrant further investigation, we need to log all reported incidents and analyse the incident trends. Metrics for dependable for incident investigation, we could include repeat causes, actual and potential losses from incidents, the facility performance, the number of qualified investigation leaders. Metrics for investigations, we could consider the average time to initiate an investigation, the number of incidents reported per unit time, and the ratio of accident to near miss reports by shift, department or the unit. Metrics associated with investigation techniques, we can look at the ratio of low, moderate, high level of effort required for the investigations and the average effort or you know, in terms of time expended per investigation. Metrics related to documentation, 
we could look at the average time to complete an investigation report. And metrics related to follow-up, we can look at the average time to resolve recommendations, the number of times recommendation completion dates are revised, the number of times presentations and review dates are revised, and the number of lessons learned communications. Trend analysis metrics, we could consider the number of investigations triggered by trend analysis. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. Continuing with the theme of quantitative and qualitative metrics, let's revisit those metrics we established for incident investigations which were to do with dependable investigation, investigation techniques, documentations, trend analysis and follow-up. The metrics for dependable, the four that we had, were quantitative. The metrics that we had for investigations, the three that we identified, were also quantitative. Metrics for investigation techniques, both of those were quantitative. And metrics for documentation, the one metric we had was quantitative. The metrics for follow-up were also all quantitative. And finally, the metrics for trend analysis were also quantitative. Measurement and metrics monitor the risk-based process safety management system's effectiveness by focusing on performance and efficiency indicators. To do this, a combination of leading and lagging indicators are the best option. And as a recap, leading influence future performance and lagging analyzes past performance. Indicators must take into account how often to collect the data and what to do with the information. Measurement of metrics is important because incident rates alone are not sensitive enough and it's important to monitor performance rather than wait for accidents to happen. Measurement of metrics provides the best option for a complete picture of process safety effectiveness and performance monitoring allows identification and corrective actions to take before a serious incident occurs. There are expectations. Metrics address performance issues, efficiency issues, or both effectiveness in all operating phases. The frequency for review and presentation needs to be clear for leadership engagement, and greater number of changes could imply greater review frequency. Otherwise, a snapshot approach should suffice, for example, scorecards or dashboards. Other expectations include collected and reported by personnel involved in the operation of the risk-based process safety management system element and its work activities, and that users of the metrics can range from those personnel to element owners to facility or corporate management. It should create synergistic harmony between the elements, in other words, feed into the audits. Focusing on maintaining a dependable practice for measurement metrics, we do of course need to involve competent personnel. We need to ensure that the scope of the metrics is appropriate, keep metric practices effective, establish consistent implementation, and determine the triggers for metrics collection and reporting. Focusing on conducting metrics acquisition, we need to implement appropriate element metrics, collect and refresh metrics, and summarize and communicate metrics in a useful format to the leadership. Focusing on metrics to make corrective actions, we need to use the measurement and metrics element to improve the other RBPS elements. Focusing on metrics for dependable, we could consider the number of risk-based process safety elements for which metrics are maintained, evidence that metrics use has caused or resulted in improvement, the number of people trained on the metrics element, number of audit findings dealing with the metrics element, and the results of audits or management reviews indicating that metrics are in consistent use. Metrics for data acquisition, we could look at the number of metrics for which data are collected, 
the refresh rate for metrics, the star files required to develop the metrics, how about the number of metric communication tools that are developed and the frequency of communicating the metrics? Metrics for corrective aspects. We could consider the percentage of management personnel that use metrics for decision making. The percentage of employees who have seen the metrics. The number of problems avoided or discovered through the use of metrics. And the frequency of metrics usage in management review meetings. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. Continuing with the theme of quantitative and qualitative metrics, we had metrics in three categories, dependable, data acquisition and corrective. Metrics that we had for dependable, the five, were all quantitative. The data acquisition metrics were also all quantitative and corrective aspects metrics were also quantitative. Auditing is a fundamental part of an effective PSM program. It ensures that the management system is performing as intended and it complements other risk-based process safety control and monitoring activities for example, management review, metrics and conduct of operations. Auditing comprises of scheduling, staffing, effectively performing and documenting. And it's a critical input for the PDCA loop. That's plan, do, check and act. Auditing is important because it evaluates and provides assurance that the risk-based process safety elements are effective towards protecting employees, customers, communities, the environment and physical assets against process safety risks. And it's also an important control mechanism within the overall management of process safety. Auditing also provides other benefits such as the identification of opportunities for improvement. For example, operability, safety awareness and compliance with regulatory requirements. There are expectations with auditing. It should be conducted throughout the development and implementation of the management system. The nature and frequency should be governed by specific factors. For example, current life cycle stage of the facility, the maturity or degree of implementation of the system, past experience, for example, previous safety performance and audit results. Other expectations include that it should be conducted at some predetermined interval. For example, once per year to once every three years are common. It should be conducted by qualified personnel selected from a variety of sources, both internally and externally, and typically done in teams. It's a methodical assessment directed by the use of written protocols. Auditing expectations also include trend analysis to determine the overall risk-based process safety system performance. And there must be management review of trends. It's not just an exercise that has to be done. Focusing on maintaining a dependable practice for auditing, we can ensure consistent implementation and identify when audits are needed. Conducting work activities for audits, we can focus on preparing for the audit, determining the scope of the audit and schedule, assembling the team and responsibilities, gathering appropriate information in advance, planning on-site activities, conducting the audit, documenting the audit and addressing audit findings and recommendations. Focusing on using audits to enhance the risk-based process safety's effectiveness, we can monitor the maturity of the risk-based process safety system over time, and we can share best practices. Looking at metrics for dependable, we could consider the percentage of near-miss and incident investigations identifying PSM system weaknesses that were undetected by previous audits, 
We could look at the percentage of audits completed according to a schedule and the percentage of audits having few significant findings and the number of audits conducted by each audit team member. Metrics to consider for conducting audits we can look at the average and maximum number of days overdue for open recommendations, the number or percentage of unresolved audit recommendations, the number of person days required to complete an audit, and the interval between completion of on-site work and completion of the audit report. Metrics for effectiveness we could look at the percentage of audit findings that are repeat findings, trends in the number or significance of findings over a series of audits at the same facility, and the percentage of recommendations that are rejected by the facility's management. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dashed line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dashed line. Continuing with the theme of quantitative and qualitative metrics, we identified metrics in three areas dependability, conducting audits and effectiveness. The four metrics we established for dependable were all quantitative and the four metrics for conducting audits that we established were also all quantitative. And finally, the three metrics we established for effectiveness were also all quantitative. Management review and continuous improvement is a routine evaluation of PSM performance, i.e. is it producing the desired results as efficiently as possible. It's an ongoing due diligence review that fills the gap between day-to-day -day work activities and periodic formal audits. But like audits, it requires scheduling, staffing and evaluation of all the risk-based process safety elements. Management review is important because performance is a critical aspect of any process safety program. It provides regular checkups on the health of the process safety management system and it supports the identification and correction of any current or pending deficiencies before they might be revealed by an audit or incident. There are expectations it should be conducted wherever risk-based process safety elements are being implemented. The system should be in place for implementing any resulting plans, for example improvement, corrective actions and verification of effectiveness. Most of the management review effort will be focused on operating facilities and like auditing it's conducted at some predetermined interval, typically once per year to once every three years. Other expectations include, like auditing, depth and frequency of reviews are governed by specific factors, for example, the current life cycle stage of the facility, the maturity or degree of implementation of the system, past experiences, for example previous safety performance and audit results, the level of management performing the review, a management's view of the risk posed by the activities to be reviewed. Some more expectations to include are that it may be scheduled in conjunction with other regularly scheduled meetings such as the facility safety committee meetings. Process supervisor to facility manager to the board of directors are involved in the periodic management reviews. Focusing on having a dependable practice for management review and continuous improvement, we need to define roles and responsibilities, establish standards for performance and validate the program's effectiveness. Focusing on conducting review activities, we need to look at preparing for the review, determining the scope of the review, scheduling the review and gathering information. We may need to prepare a presentation. Then we actually conduct the review, document the review and address the review findings and recommendations.
focusing on monitoring organizational performance, we need to strive to continuously improve and conduct field inspections. Dependable metrics we could have for management review and continuous improvement could include the percentage changes in performance goals and the number of repeat findings in reviews. Metrics for review activities could include the number of management reviews per time period, the number of deficiencies identified by management reviews, and the time required to resolve deficiencies identified by management reviews. Metrics for monitoring performance could include the type and number of findings in audits, the number of incidents attributed to risk-based process safety element failures, and the percentage of reviews delegated to subordinates. Let's think of metrics as being bounded by two different types of lines. Let's think of quantitative being bounded by a red dash line and qualitative being bounded by a blue dash line. Continuing with the theme of metrics and the three categories we had of dependable, reviewing activities and monitoring performance. For dependable, we had two metrics and they were both quantitative. The review activities metrics, the three that we had, were also quantitative and the three metrics we had for monitoring performance were also quantitative.